Uh, to finish, I would like to say, let me now welcome Bianca Brazil, who is a program manager for business engagement with the Union Convention of Biological Biodiversity. Uh, and she, is co she coordinates a global partnership and leads and helps me too much. It's <laughs> fantastic uh, on discussion with the private sector. And just before Bianca, I would like to thank Ileana Graf, uh, who helped us for, the, for the, uh, this meeting too. Bianca, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Claude, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Claude just mentioned, my name is Bianca. I am the program manager for the business and biodiversity program um, at the CBD, at the Secretariat. Um, I am very happy with the event today. Um, we were able to develop a very interesting partnership with GIZ in the past uh, few years, and we are very, very proud of it. And we hope that these events and these opportunities carry on in the future. Um, the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity has been working alongside the business um, sector and the business community um, and partners um, on a broader scale to promote a sustainable and greener and more responsible way to do business. Um, of course, uh, there are many challenges, but there are many opportunities um, in terms of the transformation that we need to see in terms of the way we do businesses to revert biodiversity loss. Since 2011, we have been coordinating the Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity, um, which is a network of networks uh, comprising 20 some initiatives worldwide, um, national and regional um, scope, um, and which uh, represents over 60 countries worldwide. And the main objective of the global, global partnership is to actually help implementation on the ground, is to liaise with companies and with the business community at large to make sure that you know, the decisions and the discussions at the CBD level trickle down and we actually can support um, small, medium and big companies in the transition that they need to make. Um, the GP also shares information on tools, mechanisms, case studies, and above all, um, as I mentioned, the support of implementation. We are very glad to see that there is a raising momentum um, in the business sphere for the biodiversity. Uh, and as most of you know, CBD is currently working on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which is a global agreement that should be adopted at COP15. The task ahead is very difficult, and we will need an approach that is all hands on deck. Um, so we are very glad to uh, be able to identify partners, uh, to be discussing with uh, several organizations worldwide um, that will help us um, uh, get the discussion going and actually engage with private sector at the local level. Um, so I'm very, very glad and, uh, to have this discussion on partnerships today because uh, governments alone won't be able to achieve what's needed to, to, to be done. Um, businesses alone won't be able to achieve what needs to be done alone. So we really need um, organizations, we need strong partnerships, we need um, all the community to come together so we can definitely um, see the change happening. So in that sense, um, I am very, very glad to be able to collaborate with GIZ. Today we will see a number of um, excellent examples of how this partnership can actually spearhead uh, many, many good um, results. And we hope to see more of this collaboration in the future. And we hope to see even more companies um, stepping forward and, and bringing these great examples to light. Thank you so much for the discussions and we'll be following um, throughout the day here. Thank you so much. Thank you to you, uh, Bianca, and uh, Charlotte, uh, Andreas, and Mauricio from GIZ. I think we can enter the, the real game. Uh, we will go into the first part uh, of our session uh, where we will hear about the relevance of uh, partnerships for the conservation and the sustainable use of biodiversity. And for this, I am excited to, uh, to present to you our first speakers. We will tell you about, about this. Uh, please welcome uh, Andreas Ketlerkant and Mauricio Solano, uh, Andreas, in the project coordinator of the global project uh, Private Business Action of Biodiversity. 
And uh, before that, he was a, a GIZ coordinator for the biodiversity cluster in Mexico and uh, di director for different bilateral biodiversity projects on access and benefit sharing, so huge program, valuation of ecosystem services and mainstreaming biodiversity into agriculture. Mauricio is a technical advisor at uh, the business and biodiversity program in uh, Central America and Dominican Republic at GIZ. And uh, he is based in Costa Rica and has been related to biodiversity conservation projects in different sectors for the last 10 years. So, Andreas, Mauricio, to you. Thank you, Claude. And thank you for the opportunity and all the organization for this webinar. Please let me know when you can, when my, my screen is being presented. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So we will speak briefly about the relevance of private-public partnerships and multi-stakeholder partnerships for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. As Claude was saying, and thank you for the introduction, my name is Mauricio Solana and I'm a technical advisor for the Business and Biodiversity Program in Central America and Dominican Republic from JZ. On behalf of the Ministry for Economic Development, Economic Cooperation and Development of, of the Federal Government of Germany. In our program, we had a first phase that went from 2014 until 2019. And now we are on a second phase that, that just started last year, 2020. On our first phase, our goal was to promote the investment of private sector into sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. And now on, on our on our second phase, our main objectives change a little bit and, and now we're, we're saying that private sector in our region, in cooperation with key stakeholders like government, academia and civil society, has contributed to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. This is because we realized that the, the biodiversity, sustainable use of biodiversity and biodiversity conservation is like a puzzle that has to be put together by, by, by several stakeholders, uh, stakeholders that, that each one holds a piece that is needed to get the whole thing done and the, and the puzzle complete. In our program, in the first phase, the, the one I just said that finished in 2019, we supported 29 different private-public partnerships with an investment of more than 4 million euros from private sector only, and we worked on, on the development of tools like the biodiversity check that the tool we presented in the, in the previous webinar, or the biodiversity monitoring tool, or we also did the coral reef monitoring with underwater drones. But all this was achieved not only but by one public and one pri private actor, but it was accomplished by several stakeholders working together in order in order to get these things done. And what we found out, and this is from from our experience, is that that. You have to find a, a, a common goal that get that gets all the all the different stakeholders united and working together. And even though every stakeholder has its its own its own main goal or main object, objective or, or immediate goal, there's a common goal that gets them all together. For example, if if we talk about academia. Their main goal could be knowledge creation or research or, or paper publication or getting getting information. But they, they have to go through a common through through one that could be a common goal in order to get this. And we could talk, for example, for for like taking an, an example, we could speak about ecosystem restoration. So academia goes through ecosystem restoration in order to get this knowledge creation or the research they're doing. Also, government, for example, they they look out for the well-being of the of the common well-being well-being of the population, and they have to get into initiatives like ecosystem restoration, for example, in order to get this this common well-being or to or to promote this common well-being. Private sector uh, also looks for products and services and and profit, and in order to to maintain the, their products and services and profit, they go through a common goal that could be ecosystem restoration and ecosystem restoration will let them 
keep on producing products and services on, on a long term and getting all the profit. International cooperation looking for sustainable development, something similar, and nonprofit or, or NGOs uh, related to biodiversity uh, could go through this common goal also to get ecosystem conservation, for example. So what, what I want to say here is, is that we have to look for this common goal in order to get all the participants together. And if we do this, here you can see why multiple stakeholder partnerships should be considered in biodiversity conservation initiatives, and that's also from our experience. Uh, the first one is that budget goes up. These partnerships use the resources different stakeholders have, not only economic resources, also knowledge, experience, or human resources, but definitely the budget goes up and, and it's stronger. Every stakeholder benefits from the partnership. If you get several stakeholders, the number of people benefiting from the initiative increases, definitely. Uh, complex problems can be solved. This is because the, the approach to tackle complex problems can be uh, from different angles, can, can be approached from different angles, depending on the on the expertise each stakeholder has. So this this can help to, to solve complex problems. Equal position in these partnerships. Partners are in an equal position, so the, the responsibility relies on several stakeholders. And long term engage, long term engagement. Usually, this this common goal is just the beginning, but the, the processes or the projects go further more than than this, and and a long term engagement is achieved. And Andreas or Charlotte? Yes, yes unfortunately. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not <hello>. Andreas, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Andreas is having uh, connection problems, so I'll step in. I'm working uh, with Andreas um, in the Private Business Action for Biodiversity project. Oh, Andreas came back to us. We've been trying okay. for about 10 minutes. Andreas, great. And Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm so sorry that it, doesn't, it did not work. Um, Okay, um, thank you, Mauricio. Um, I wanted to, to share with you some uh, general results from our project, um, Private Business Action for Biodiversity. Uh, I was director of this project uh, in the last four years. And um, for us, uh, it was one of the conclusions, uh, one of the uh, uh, most striking experience also that uh, in the activity fields that we have found that we identified uh, regarding the mainstream of biodiversity into the uh, uh, mechanisms and instruments of the business sector and to promote biodiversity friendly production commercialization the multi-stakeholder partnerships was one of the uh, success factors uh, in nearly all the activities we have realized. Um, the project itself was financed by the Ministry for the Environment in Germany. Uh, it started in uh, 2016, about now five years. And as a global project, it had its headquarters in Germany, but working on three pilots in uh, Brazil, India and Mexico. And I want to only to highlight some aspects which are which is regarding to the uh, multi-stakeholder engagement and the, the work together in the pilot uh, activities could you please give the second slide mauricio so um, um, i want to highlight three um, cases in the case of the initiative for responsible kanuba i will Kanauba, I don't want to get into detail, details because Gutenberg Pereira will make uh, a, a, sp uh, um, a specific uh, contribution later on. I only wanted to highlight that working uh, on and uh, together with companies in different positions along the Kanauba box supply chains, together with uh, UBT uh, and uh, um, 
um, uh, the, the, uh, the Brazilian government, it was uh, very um, uh, important for us to um, have common goals regarding the uh, work on Kanauba works uh, together, for instance, with the trade unions and NGOs, and uh, looking uh, and getting together uh, on a joint agenda on social and environmental issues. So this was one of the factors for um, success that we had to come together in the case uh, in in Brazil. Um, I wanted to highlight also two other um, areas, which is the in India, um, the um, foundation for a public-private partnership in the spices sector. From our pilots, we were working on different spices and um, um, together with the Indian government and uh, the initiative to build up a national sustainable spice program, we had um, the chance to work also together with different organizations, um, the uh, um, head of organizations on uh, the World Spice Organizations, for instance, or IDH. And uh, this was also um, very uh, um, uh, important to get a, uh, a joint understanding also on uh, how to deal with the biodiversity issues within the spice production. Um, for, for us, it was uh, interesting working together with NGOs, uh, international NGOs uh, like Rainforest Alliance or Global Nature Fund to uh, create instruments like the biodiversity action plans together with the, product, uh, pro with the producers of spices. And it was a big motivation also for the companies to continue later on financing biodiversity-friendly activities through public-private partnership uh, agreement. So uh, lately, I want also to highlight what we have done in Mexico, working on agaves uh, with um, uh, different actors. And also there, the uh, definition of common goals had been crucial also, uh, so that uh, together with different agave producers, the, un the university and companies and NGOs, it was uh, uh, one of the uh, um, most important uh, activities to have a common understanding also um, on uh, the uh, uh, ecosystem services and biodiversity within the agave production. In this case, we concentrated also on monitoring systems regarding bats as uh, uh, looking into the uh, bat-friendly production of agaves. So this was also one of the activities which uh, were very necessary to building trust between the different groups and uh, was essential then also for having uh, um, a, a good outcome or interesting outcomes and lessons learned through our pilots. So in in total, in uh, summary, in the different activities we were working on, the most of the combinations uh, with uh, between the different sectors, private sector, public sector, the NGOs and the academics had been the uh, ingredients to uh, get into a successful mainstreaming of biodiversity issues in the production schemes. So thank you very much. Thank you to you, uh, Andreas and Mauricio, and uh, it's a very interesting and, and fascinating, but crucial, uh, as you said, that uh, to tackle uh, to tackle uh, complexity of uh, of things, uh, the the partnership, public and private, and the network of actors is mo mandatory, if I can say. Now we are coming uh, to our second part of the webinar experience um, and uh, success story. Uh, and for this, um, we invited several representatives with various backgrounds who have experience with private sector engagement in multi-stakeholders partnership for biodiversity. And uh, at the end of the session, uh, you, you, you will have two opportunity to, to question, uh, to have questions to ask, and, um, and uh, it will be, I, I hope, uh, good. Uh, and first, um, uh, please uh, chat if you want. Huh? Uh, first, I'd like to present to you uh, Gutenberg Ferreira. He is a commercial director at Brazil Ferras, 
actively representing the company uh, in the initiative for responsible carnaba for I, I i know that for the last two years and uh, helping to shape uh, the next generation of carnaba supply chain and during his presentation he will tell us more about the initiative for responsible carnaba please get them back to you thank you thank you so much uh, as you have mentioned my name is Gutenberg, I'm from Brazil Ceres, which is one of the companies uh, in the IRC, the Institute for Responsible Carnova, uh, that is also included the, the UEBT, the Union for Ethical Biotrade, and the GIZ. Um, then we can go ahead to the next slide, as I will be presenting the chain and also what is uh, the carnal uh, The carnal is uh, the tree that grows in the northeast of Brazil. This uh, orange part, and mainly in the green part of the orange that you were seeing the northeast part of Brazil. Uh, the works during uh, powder is extracted from the leaves and the works processing companies as Brazil series transform the powder into the wine. Also, it provides a number of ecological and social benefits as watershed protection, prevention of soil erosion, and also habitats for the local fauna. It provides as well work for local population and is used in local handicraft. Next, please. As uh, you may see it's in different sectors and it's uh, used in the automotive industries, uh, also in the cosmetics, pharmaceutical, food, as well as in other kinds of industries that we discover day after day. Um, of course, in the Carnova value chain, there is some key challenge that we have to tackle. As the social challenge, uh, in, uh, the, the main uh, purpose of uh, the IRC in the beginning was uh, to uh, address the problems related to the undignified working conditions as the modern is laboring. Uh, the land, uh, the landowner is usually not the producer of the granola, and it, it is a kind of seasonal labor as it takes place during six months of the year, and in some parts only three months. Uh, it's the time that uh, this kind of business happens in that area. Also, there is some challenge uh, as the yield. Your generation migrates to the main major cities in Brazil and living the rural areas. As well, there is some biodiversity challenge as invasive species, uh, deforestation, habitat loss, uh, as well as degradation of the species diversity and density. There is also some poor harvesting techniques that is still being used in this kind of uh, chain and the lack of monitoring, uh, which can be uh, very, we have addressed already and the initiative is working with other partners to make it uh, better as well. And there is some economical, economic challenge as the lack of alternative source of income to different uh, uh, to, to the population that work in the fields, the traceability, also the lack of technology, technological innovation, because this is a more than 100 years old uh, chain and there is very few technical innovations and the problems related to the harvest losses is, is, uh, is being tackled. Next slide, please. So the this is the how the chain the supply chain works in the Carnaval. 
It comes from the forest as an endemic species is grow naturally. Uh, the landowner uh, usually uh, uh, make available to the producers of carnauba powder for the rural producers uh, that will exploit the this kind of uh, area to extract the material, the powder, and then uh, usually the family business, they uh, have the family members that will uh, get the powder through bad heating and also through machine heating. And the rural producers, uh, as they have employees in their areas and in the areas that they are exploit exploiting and exploring, uh, those machines will be uh, used mainly, not the bad heating. And then the kernel powder is sold to the factory as Brazil service. The pack, which is uh, the term of adjustment of conduct, uh, it was brought by the public, public prosecutor of uh, work in Brazil. They have requested most of the companies uh, related to Carnauba uh, to sign it in order to avoid uh, the, the work that is not uh, legally speaking uh, very correct uh, as the used to have different uh, people without the uh, regular um, working legislations and under the the legal um, requirements. So next is like this. Uh, about Brazil Series, the company that I work for and my commercial director, it was founded in 20, uh, in 2001. Uh, it was first Carnauba, uh, this was the first Carnauba Lights Factory in January, Piauí, uh, only from Piauí State. And also uh, the raw material that we extract comes only from suppliers in our own state. Uh, it, it is a strategic location as Campo Maior, the, the city where the company Sorry, I think there was some connection problem. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's OK. Sorry. And uh, this strategic location in Campo Maior, the, the region that we have, it's uh, one of the highest concentration of Carnauba trees in the state of Piauí. Then also, uh, the, the Brazil Center was the first company uh, to sign the tag, as I explained. Um, with the Minister of Labor in Brazil, also uh, working to tackle the, the problems that we have uh, and use to have in this field. Next slide, please. Uh, nowadays, those are the certifications that we already have and the memberships that we are part of as uh, we just in the end of 2020, we have received the Fair for Life uh, certification, which is uh, very important for us as we are working for a long time to address those issues and make the, the business as fair as possible. And we are also uh, going to be organic certified soon. Next. Uh, right now, I, I will enter definitely uh, speaking about the initiative, uh, the IRC, and we are going to address the, the details about the initiative, memberships, and members, actual members, current members of the initiative. Slide, please. Uh, the initiative was launched in 2018 and with the support of, from GIZ, it works with all, most of Brazilian um, factories 
are part of this and some of the biggest in the market that are part of this uh, initiative. Uh, as we have international international actors in the carnival wax production industry, the government and civil society institutions are also part of this initiative. We have a kind of preferential supplier program in the IRC, and the initiative also supports carnival processing companies improve the living and working conditions of workers in the carnival extraction, also promoting biodiversity in and around the carnival fields. UBT facilitates also the IRC secretariat. Next, please. Those are the current members of the IRC. Uh, for more details, please visit the website. And we are always accepting new members uh, if they are interested in joining and also uh, having the agreements and commitments that we fulfill in this area involving Carnot. Next, please. Uh, the main commitments of the members inside of the IRC, uh, just separating, we have the wax processing companies that has, uh, they have to sign the UBT or equivalent, and also we need uh, the tech implementation from those companies in order to be accepted in the initiative. There is also the need for traceability up to the level of the field workers and family farmers. And there is the need of service 100% verified or certified for now. The distributors uh, and the final product manufacturers, they have to become uh, IRC members commit to buy Carnival Wax from processing companies that comply with the verified cert uh, or certified Carnival against the IRC recognized standards. So those are the main requirements to become IRC members. And in the next slide, uh, I will talk more. It's uh, uh, just a thank you for the attention, but also I, I would like to share the experience that we have since uh, I joined the initiative. We have participated in other initiatives as well, but I haven't seen one like the IRC that is uh, very eager to tackle the problems that is uh, that was happening or that could happen in this kind of uh, uh, of supply chain. And we have different projects that uh, are happening with different partners and suppliers, and the IRC was able to make everyone uh, work together to try to help this uh, as a good stakeholder partnership. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you Vitando. <laughs> I am a little bit in a hurry with a key timekeeper no on that. Yes. Thank you. Canoba is a perfect example of a, a local economy, uh, but regional too, at a regional scale, and I say large dimensions, and uh, it's embark many dimensions and the consequent uh, impact of economy. Thank you very much. Now yes, we will go just, to... Just one, one small thing. We have shared, uh, I believe uh, Charlotte has shared a video with, uh, for, for those who want to know more about the Canal Bar Supply Chain. Thank you. Okay. It is Thank in the much. chat. We will, we will see it. Now we will uh, we will go over to Jake Keel. Uh, he is a sustainability innovator, author, and award-winning documentary filmmaker. And uh, for 16 years, Grupo Punta Cana has received numerous international awards, including awards from the World Travel and Tourism Council and National Geographic Traveler. His book, Waking the Sleeping Giant, uh, unlocking the hidden power of business to save our planet. Uses example for we, his vast experience is Punta Cana to demonstrate how business can become drivers of a sustainability agenda. And uh, we are sure, uh, we are excited to listen to your presentation, Jake. Please. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending where you're coming from. Uh, I mentioned I'm uh, Vice President of uh, Google Punta Cana in our area of sustainability. Um, and I wanted to share some of our experience um, building partnerships of multi-stakeholders in the Dominican Republic. And many of the initiatives that we have undertaken uh, have started within our property. Uh, Google Punta Cana is a resort development that has um, a number of different companies. The uh, Canada is um, formed by an international airport, numerous hotel properties uh, and private um, uh, real estate development, as well as a number of companies uh, related to the infrastructure of the resort, uh, water co company, electric company, and a uh, security company. So we are almost uh, operating as a small city and we have used our platform as a small city to try and drive uh, sustainability as a, a major feature of what we do. We make uh, sustainability a huge part of our efforts. Uh, we make a large investment in it. Uh, and we've been fortunate to have really good partners over the years, including uh, the GIZ and uh, Davio out of Central America. And what we've done in this case in the marine protected area, if you go to the next slide, um, we for many years had been looking for ways to have some authority over uh, the area in front of our property, uh, which is approximately eight kilometers of coastline. And we were looking to uh, regulate boat traffic, recreational boating, uh, fishing, uh, limit the impacts of onshore development uh, on the local ecosystem, the coral reef, uh, mangrove, and seagrass beds in front of our property. Uh, and we have been working with the government to discover, to find ways that we could contribute to this management. Uh, and in 2009, uh, the Dominican government named a rather large area as a marine uh, protected area, the Southeast Marine Reef Sanctuary. And you can see it um, on the right side of the screen um, where there is a large blue area. If you go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, you'll see um, that the, uh, the, the reef sanctuary is a massive marine protected area which starts from the beginning of Punta Cana and the Cabeza de Toro area and wraps all the way around the southern part of the the tip of the Dominican Republic to San Pedro de Macorís. And so it became clear early on that one of the things our company would need to do was uh, to uh, find other partners to work with. This area was clearly too big for one entity to take on. Um, and also it was very complex. There are different hotel properties, different fishing communities. There are uh, cruise docks, uh, marinas, uh, and a national park square in the middle of the sanctuary. And so we began negotiating with the Dominican government uh, and we recruited a number of local partners. And again, Grupo Punta Cana's primary interest was uh, limiting uh, environmental impacts in our uh, area of influence, which is again, approximately eight kilometers of coastline. But as you can see, this is far more than simply our area of influence. Um, but it made sense to try and build a partnership where we'd have multiple uh, actors involved in the management of this resource uh, and, and come up with a management regime that made sense uh, from a regional perspective. And so ultimately what we did was divide this enormous area into three different zones. The southern zone, which is uh, made up of La Romana and Valle Ibe, and a number of public and private entities that operate in that area, uh, hotel, hotel association, a tourism cluster, um, and, and uh, international NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and Food Finance, and then also constituting uh, the Dominican government as sort of the oversight. There is another uh, central zone, which is primarily made up of uh, a number of private entities. And then on the Eastern zone, it is our company, uh, the Eastern Tourism Cluster of Alta Gracia, uh, the Hotel Association uh, and the Association of Aquatic Zones, of uh, aquatic operators. So these are excursion operators um, that operate to the, in the hotel area to the north of Punta Cana. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Essentially what we're trying to do uh, is 
look at an area that has been uh, traditionally has a huge uh, tourism footprint, um, has many hotels. The Punta Cana region alone has close to 45,000 hotel rooms. Uh, it has uh, the number of excursions operating, uh, marine excursions, whether it's recreational boaters, whether it is snorkeling, scuba diving, um, and any other number of aquatic activities. Uh, and one of the primary ideas of the co-management is to organize um, these activities in a way that has as limited impact as possible on the coastline. So that is putting in mooring buoys, putting in uh, channel markers, uh, developing recreational boating rules and putting in the infrastructure you need and the oversight to implement that. And so that has happened in our property in Google Punta Cana, and now we're expanding it into other sections of the, of the sanctuary, uh, headed primarily to the north of our property, to the area of Cabeza del Toro, and that's a project uh, we have been recently initiated with the GIZ uh, as part of a developed project, so it's a public-private partnership project. Um, you go to the next slide. Another major component of the project uh, is establishing fish refuges. So fishery refuges, also known as no-take zones or no-fishing zones, essentially uh, the Dominican Republic is a country that has been deeply impacted by overfishing uh, and that has a direct impact on the health and well-being of the coral reefs. The coral reefs, of course, are an important resource for protecting beaches and built infrastructure on the coastline such as hotels and resort properties. And so this is an area uh, known as the aquarium. This is inside of um, the sanctuary and in front of our property. And for many years, we've had a very close relationship with the local fishermen. And we've been uh, working with the local fishermen to develop other alternative employment opportunities, other livelihoods for the fishers and their families, uh, and declaring certain areas that would be free of fishing uh, and, and specifically of night fishing and spear fishing, which are particularly damaging to reef species. And so this area is now pretty well documented as one of the only successfully operated fish refuges in the, in the Dominican Republic. And it has some of the highest fish density um, in the country. Uh, and this is something that we'd like to replicate throughout the sanctuary, something that's a strategy that we think makes a lot of sense for tourism. It's a win for, for fishermen if we can get them to buy into the concept. Uh, and it has a, a long-term impact on the health of the coral reef. Can you go to the next slide, please? So another piece of uh, this uh, strategy for the marine sanctuary is creating new tourist attractions. Uh, when you have an area like the aquarium that has high fish density that's very attractive for snorkeling and scuba attractions and so you run the risk of having overcrowding or over tourism in these areas everybody wants to go to the most attractive space uh, that has now uh, been magnified significantly with uh, the adoption of instagram and social media where people see an image of somewhere they really want to go and then that becomes a serious impact and pressure on that area and so one of the strategies we've used to limit the impact on the successfully managed area in the aquarium is by creating new attractions in other areas. And so we've had a sunk ship, a World War II vessel um, that is now a, a wreck that people can dive on. We've created shallow excursions by putting in uh, statues of Tainos, the native uh, Indian population in uh, the Dominican Republic and using sort of traditional artists um, to create these attractions with mixes of uh, coral restoration. And the idea is to diversify the different areas where tourists are going to lessen the impact on, on some of the, the more intact spaces. Uh, we can continue here. We've also done um, archaeological attractions. The Dominican Republic is well known as an area uh, where there was quite a lot of activity of colonial ships. Uh, and it's the eastern coast of Dominican Republic is filled with different wrecks and ships. And so we developed an area, it's called a living underwater museum. And this is essentially archaeological pieces where you can tell the story of the ships that were in that area and it becomes a dive attraction. And again, diverting some of the traffic of divers from the more uh, well-visited sites. You can go to the next one, please. Uh, another very important aspect of the management practices in the sanctuary that we're seeking uh, is to integrate fisher families in the sanctuary. 
uh, and specifically creating alternative livelihoods or new employment opportunities or even complementary employment uh, so the fishermen and their families um, can find other ways to earn a living that is not specifically an exploiting local uh, coral reef fish populations, but also doing activities such as uh, coral restoration, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, when we get to the section on the consortium that we've developed. Uh, and tr we've trained now a group of fishermen uh, and uh, certified them as divers, and now they're able to uh, help us and be hired by us and other entities to do a coral restoration uh, in our region. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. We've also engaged uh, local fisher families uh, in helping control the invasive lionfish population. So now we have a new species that's come into our area and the region in the Caribbean. Uh, this is an invasive species from the Pacific that was brought to our region. And one of the strategies to control the lionfish is to harvest them, uh, whether for human consumption in restaurants or, or local consumption. And we stumbled across uh, an innovative uh, way to integrate the local uh, fisher families by creating artisanry. Uh, and essentially, these are stuffed lionfish. We brought in a taxidermist from Cuba who trained our team in how to do this. And now this becomes a, a source of income for the fishermen's families, for their wives and children uh, that can create uh, tourist uh, um, products to be sold locally. And we've helped market these. Uh, each of these becomes uh, something that is an attraction to be sold uh, locally and also controls the population of this fish species. If you go to the next slide. We've the also worked. Uh, yes. We've, uh, sorry. The next one, I hope, because I'm late with uh, with uh, following. No, this is perfect. Uh, so this is another activity we did uh, uh, working with local fishermen um, to train them in other livelihoods. So this is a boat captain course, and we train 28, trained and certified 28 uh, local fishermen as boat captains. Uh, and the idea being that, you know, Grupo Punta Cana as a company is not necessarily in a position to hire 28 boat captains. We don't have that kind of volume of traffic. However, with these skills, uh, these fishermen can find work in other areas of the tourism, uh, tourism industry in our region. Uh, whether for private boaters, for excursion operators, for hotels. And the idea is that basically the fishermen have a skill set that's being underutilized. They have experience in the water. They know the local habitat. Uh, many of them have a lot of experience, whether fixing fiberglass on boats, whether it's fishing, fixing and maintaining engines, uh, and, and looking at different ways that we can involve the local fishermen in the tourism economy. And again, many of these fishermen will continue to fish, or fish on the side or as a, a sidelight, but many of them will also uh, offer their services in tourism or conservation related activities. Can you go to the next slide, please? And again, the, this is a group of fishermen that were trained uh, as paddy scuba divers, uh, so they could accompany uh, dive excursions uh, and help not only restore reefs, but also accompany tourists on dive excursions. So these are all ways that the local fishermen become uh, part of the economy. Uh, it is far easier to hire, to train and hire local fishermen than it is to try and uh, put out patrol boats and monitor fishing activities. But as you'll see uh, in the next slide, please, uh, we also have a program uh, for patrolling the local coast uh, implementing fishing rules in uh, coordination with the with the Dominican government, with the local fisheries authority, and also with the Ministry of Environment. Um, and really, it's all about compliance of the existing laws. There's very few uh, laws in the Dominican Republic related to fishing um, that are not uh, already on the books, uh, things that limit certain types of fishing, uh, certain seasonalities for certain species, and also uh, limit um, certain zones for fishing, like these fish refugees. So really the idea is beginning to implement and actually do uh, patrolling and using the private sector as uh, the platform for providing boats, for providing staffing, for providing gas, uh, for uh, communication, for working with fishermen when there are violations by other fishermen. Uh, and really the private sector in our area, there really isn't a huge uh, of the government presence, especially in terms of fisheries. It's a chronically underfunded area of the government. So 
uh, by having private sector support, both economic, logistical, uh, and authoritative, uh, we, can, we can really begin to uh, improve the management of this marine sanctuary. So this marine sanctuary has now uh, really taken shape. It's been, as I mentioned, divided into these three zones. And as part of our uh, work with the GIZ and this new development project, we're building uh, a visitor center where we'll have local tourists learn about the sanctuary. There is a fee structure being implemented for the use of the sanctuary. So excursions related to diving and snorkeling will pay a fee that will go to our entity, the, the Eastern uh, Sanctuary Alliance, which is made up of public and private partners. And then that, those resources will be used to uh, finance many of the, the, the activities that I've named here. So I think this is a really unique model. The Dominican Republic is uniquely positioned to have co-management um, of protected areas. There is quite a bit of experience on land-based protected areas for there to be co-management, whether by uh, mostly by nonprofit entities, but with assistance from the private sector. And so this is uh, a, a growing area and one the Dominican government is interested in, recognizing that they have limited resources, limited capacity, and really the most interested parties in seeing something like the marine sanctuary protected are the private sector uh, companies that are uh, taking advantage of this area and building businesses around this area and really depend on the health and well-being of these ecosystems for their business. Uh, and we recognize that the local community is an important part of that. So um, this is a really unique model uh, and, and something we're, we're, we're very uh, enthusiastic about and we feel pretty optimistic about in terms of its potential uh, in the future. I just wanted to quickly go over uh, another initiative that we worked uh, for numerous years, we go to the next slide, um, with uh, the GIZ and many other partners. Uh, and this was creating a Dominican Consortium for Coastal Restoration. These are the initials in Spanish, uh, the CBRC. And basically, um, our foundation, uh, Google Cumbacana Foundation, was one of the pioneers in coral restoration in the Dominican Republic. We began the work in 2005 when really no one was talking about coral restoration on a large scale. Uh, we set up a few nurseries of a single species uh, and began uh, transplanting uh, corals that grew really well in these nurseries back onto the reef. Uh, and over the last 16 years, we've uh, transplanted close to eight kilometers of coral tissue from our nurseries back onto the reef and developed new techniques uh, of land-based nurseries, expanding the types of diversity of uh, coral that we can grow in nurseries and transplant back onto the reef. But we discovered pretty early on that as the interest grew uh, in coral restoration, uh, that not all practitioners followed the same standards uh, many were using it more as a marketing tool or more as a, a fundraising tool. And so we became very concerned because obviously uh, if we're putting a lot of effort and investment into coral restoration with a science base and a conservation strategy, uh, and we're getting resources from important entities like the GIZ and the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank and other partners uh, that are serious conservation organizations like Nature Conservancy, but we really didn't want there to be um, coral restoration happening that wasn't at the highest standards. Uh, and, the, and the Dominican government was not in a great position to really oversee what was happening with many coral restoration projects around the, around the island. So we created this Dominican consortium with other partners, including Fundemar, and now it's expanded and has a number of partners. And basically it's setting up principles for coral restoration in the Dominican Republic and really setting up an infrastructure to oversee the nurseries around the island, the types of techniques that are being used, the health and well-being of each of these nurseries, and trying to avoid the creation of what we call ghost nurseries, where you set up a nursery that's funded by someone and then you forget about it because, uh, because the resources or the manpower are not there to continue it and, and really carry it out as a long-term project. And so the idea of the consortium is have an independent entity made up of organizations that are very serious about restoration uh, and oversee the nurseries and, and do regular monitoring of nurseries around the island. So you go to the, the next slide. And so we do regular events where we do knowledge sharing between the different partners. Uh, we go to each other's sites and learn different techniques as coral restoration has begun to expand. We now have all types of new techniques that people are using to uh, 
transplant the corals, to grow the corals, to reproduce corals with uh, greater genetic diversity. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of sharing through this consortium. We also have funding to do monitoring, and we've now trained uh, staff from the Ministry of the Environment to participate in these monitoring events. So literally, the private sector and our partners has been informing the government of the Dominican Republic how to participate and how to uh, oversee this work, which is relatively new uh, in, in this region. We can go to the next slide, because it's the last slide. Yeah, we are very uh, late. I'm, I'm sorry, we are so late. Yes, if so you could, uh, if you could conclude, it's a very important. Yes, okay, so uh, just to conclude, um, I think the Dominican Republic has a number of examples of uh, really interesting partnerships between public and private sector, uh, and we'd be glad to share more information uh, about how we can share that in other parts of the, of the region. Thank you, Jake. Thank you very much. It's so impressive. We, we, we would have so many things to, 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 to say and to, to, to discuss. Now we'll go over to the presentation from the Honduran Brewery. And there's a small chain of plan, I think, as Carla Havila won't be able to join us today. And instead, we welcome Julio Flores, who is the communication manager of the brewery. And he has been uh, 13 years with the company and uh, working in different roles in the legal and corporate affairs area, focusing on license to operate, sustainability and corporate relations. And at the brewery, uh, they work on the purpose of uniting people for a better world, contributing to the development and the growth of Honduras. Then please, Julio, to you. Hi everyone, thank you, um, thank you for the introduction and good morning everybody, everyone. Um, well, um, first of all, thank you. Um, we are going to share with uh, you this initiative we have um, in Honduras. Um, Cervecería Hondureña, as part of AP InBev, we have we work for a dream. Our dream is uh, to get people people together for a better world. And we are working in many initiatives, uh, and one of these initiatives is related to, to water protection. Uh, next. This initiative is called a Water Security Alliance for San Pedro Sula City. Let me tell you uh, about San Pedro Sula City. San Pedro Sula City is our industrial city, is the city where, where we have our uh, uh, beer production plant, where we have our soft drinks production plant, where we produce our beers and soft drinks. And, and in San Pedro Sula is located what we call uh, El Merendon Mountain. It's a huge mountain that generates all the water of the city and generates the water of ma that many industries use for their uh, production process. Uh, since seven years ago, uh, organizations, institutions, and company, we began agreements to run the technical secretariat of the alliance. And also, um, Cervecería Hondureña was the first company that uh, began with this alliance with uh, the uh, San Pedro Sula municipality. This is an alliance that is integrated by central and local government, uh, San Pedro Sula municipality, with uh, civil society participation and private company. In this case, with the support of the German De Development Corporation. Um, we are a platform, a multi-sectoral platform uh, that cooperate uh, to coordinate and promote efforts that contribute to the preservation and management of watershed from the Merendon Reservation Zone. As vision, uh, we want to be a solid platform with capacity and leadership to articulate efforts that contribute to water security of San Pedro Sula. Next. Well, um, we, we are focusing in four aspects. One, uh, environmental education. Two, sustainable uh, practices. Uh, three, accountability. And four, science and knowledge. We have been working together with private sector, public sector, uh, in order to, um, to, uh, to, to implement different initiatives and programs in uh, El Merendon Mountain. 
Next, please. This is a graphical representation uh, the, of what of our initiative related to water in El Merendon Mountain. We are working together with local farmers in order that they can produce uh, in a more uh, sustainability way. Um, they can use. Um, we are promoting a responsible use of water. We are promoting environmental education, and we are uh, giving them uh, tools and new knowledge to produce in a better uh, way. We're working also with the value chain of cocoa producers uh, in the zone in order that they can produce the fruit and also they can produce chocolate tablets. Also, we are working together with the municipality, uh, uh, working together on, on forest fire prevention and protection of forests. Next. Uh, some of our accomplishments in 2020 uh, support from a German uh, cooperation, development cooperation in MARTUR is achieved. Uh, develop of a training program for alliance members and private sector actors. Uh, water forums is held on the establishment of water funds, technical and legal uh, analysis for the design and creation of the public private mechanism and uh, creation of capaci capacities for the members of the Alliance. It's very important to tell you that this is a key initiative. This is a unique initiative, a best practice in our country. San Pedro Sula is the first city in the country that has an alliance like this. And we are very proud of being uh, the first uh, company from the private sector that um, get involved in this uh, initiative uh, with uh, public sector and working together with the German development uh, cooperation. Next. As next steps, um, follow up uh, an execution of managed projects and um, integrate new members to the alliance. This is very important at this point because we want to integrate new companies, uh, big companies, uh, promote and share the experience of the alliance in other regions of the country. As I was telling you, this is a best practice in our country and we, wa we want to replicate, we want to be an example for other uh, cities. Uh, consolidate and strengthen the alliance, um, strengthening uh, its governance, uh, execute other projects that um, can influence and uh, prioritize uh, measures to contribute to water security. So in short terms, in short words, uh, this is uh, our um, uh, water security alliance. This is the way we have been working since seven years ago. Cerveceria Hondureña was the first company from the private sector that got, that get involved in, in, in leading this uh, progress and evolution of the security alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. I was listening to education and accountability. It's so important. Thank you very much. And uh, it was very, very interesting example. And um, uh, now we will go over the, to Alfredo uh, Bolio, who is an agro-industrial entrepreneur with more than 30 years of business experience among uh, other positions. He was the former Minister of Agriculture and Livestock, the former Minister of Economy, Industry and Commerce, and the former president of the National Bank of Costa Rica. Welcome to you, uh, Mario. Alfredo, part three. You there? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. We are listening to you. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank, let me thank you all for the invitation to participate in this um, interesting webinar. Uh, to share some of the experiences that we have uh, achieved so far in our company and uh, uh, that produces uh, that produces uh, pineapples for the world market. As uh, you may know, our main assets for the uh, production of pineapples are natural resources whether they are uh, water, soil, sunlight, forests that we have around uh, our plantations. And uh, so those are key elements 
that have uh, uh, put us in a position in which we have been able to reach some interesting uh, goals so far, and then plans that we have been uh, uh, working on with the uh, uh, local representation of uh, GIZ here in Costa Rica. And uh, a proof of that is that a uh, uh, couple of days ago or so, we have had the visits of uh, uh, government officials uh, within uh, the company here, uh, alongside with a, a lot of people from GIC that were present here, which uh, demonstrate the kind of uh, agreements and partnerships that we have created between ourselves, uh, uh, our stakeholders, and uh, government authorities that are crucial for these endeavors that we are uh, that we are embarked in. Uh, just to give you uh, next, please. Uh, just to give you a quick um, snapshot of uh, of what Costa Rica is in the world market of uh, fresh pineapples. We are the uh, uh, the leader by far, with a market share of. Uh, over 80%, both in the US and European markets. Uh, it is a very uh, crucial industry for our country where uh, a lot of uh, direct and indirect jobs are uh, part, uh, crucial part of uh, what, we, uh, what we are achieving uh, uh, here. So uh, for a tiny country such as Costa Rica to have uh, a market share of this uh, of of this size in the world is uh, is is quite an uh, an amazing accomplishment, and we have achieved that by uh, working uh, very closely with uh, our partners in order to create the current uh, the current elements that that we have for this uh, type of uh, production. Uh, in our country that serves the markets of uh, several parts of the world. Next, please. Just to um, uh, give you an example of the way that we do it, uh, this uh, group uh, out of Washington, D.C. tracks the residues, uh, the pesticide and agrochemicals, uh, pest, uh, residues of uh, the different products uh, uh, that are marketed in the world. And uh, in this case, um, they create a couple of lists, one which is called the Clean 15 and the other one which is called the Dirty Dozen. Uh, in, in our case, the pineapples are always in the top three most clean products that are on the shelves of the supermarkets regarding, uh, regarding uh, pesticide residues. So it is clear that we can uh, achieve that in a sustainable way that is going to be good for consumers worldwide. Next, please. Next. As, as a company, we are located in the northern part of uh, Costa Rica, bordering uh, Nicaragua, uh, where we have uh, uh, a little bit over 2,500 hectares of land in which uh, we have a little bit over 800 hectares of conservation areas, which put us in this uh, interesting uh, threshold of uh, a little bit over 30% of our area in conservation areas. Uh, so we can, uh, we can say that we are pretty much aligned with the global objectives of uh, conservation with production uh, alongside. Uh, we are the largest employer in the region, and uh, of course, we have tremendous uh, amount of partnerships and relationships with our stakeholders, and uh, which uh, which is the way that, that that we do things. And this is one of the key elements uh, that we have uh, worked so far with GIZ in order to uh, be a very interesting example of the way how things can be uh, done and achieved. Next, please. Uh, a group of our certifications, uh, uh, of course, when you are um, producing for the world, uh, we have to comply with uh, lots of regulations uh, from um, end uh, consumers, in our case, uh, retailers uh, in different parts of the world. So we are 
uh, open and um, uh, always uh, in processes with uh, audits from uh, those uh, customers that are always coming into our uh, our operation in order to audit uh, our our processes. Uh, next, please. Um, uh, next. We have uh, we have developed a very interesting project uh, a few years ago, which is now part of this uh, agreement that we have with GIZ Local, which is uh, a, 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 a nursery, a forest nursery that we have created uh, uh, already. We have produced 78 uh, tree species with a goal to uh, 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 reach the amount of uh, close to 200 tree species that are uh, uh, that are part of the environment that we have here. So far, we have next, please. We have um, um, we have produced uh, uh, more than 100 uh, 100,000 trees that we have given away for different entities, including government uh, agencies that are that are uh, using those uh, trees for reforestation processes that uh, are taking place in different areas of, uh, of the country, as well as uh, local here in the, in the region. Uh, next. Next. Uh, this uh, this, uh, um, this uh, forest uh, uh, nursery that we have uh, created uh, has uh, been pretty much in line with our set of uh, objectives of uh, sustainable production in, in the country. Of course, uh, there are key elements that have to do with social issues, key elements that have to do with uh, uh, environmental uh, elements and biodiversity. And of course, this has uh, to be based on uh, financial success, which is what we are all teaming up in uh, trying to achieve those. Uh, in that sense, next please. In that sense, uh, we are pretty much aligned with the UN Sustainable Goals in, uh, in which amazingly we have, we have key elements that touch each one, uh, each single one of the 17 uh, 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 sustainable goals. Uh, uh, the company itself, uh, uh, has an impact in, in each one of them, and we feel very proud about it. And I think that uh, this is a, uh, uh, as we were discussing before, this is a very interesting, uh, uh, a very interesting example of uh, how, how an agricultural project that goes from the farm to the plate, in this case, to the different uh, parts of the world where we serve those markets by way of retailers, uh, we can achieve that in a very, very uh, sustainable way uh, with participation of uh, many stakeholders that are taking, taking part of uh, this process. So uh, I think that um, we, can, uh, we can discuss later on more details about it, but we are uh, feeling very proud about this and of course very thankful for our commitments and our uh, relationship with GIC in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo Bolio. Uh, so impressive that uh, that demonstrates the international dimension of uh, of an impact of uh, of bio trade, and that is very unique. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we will uh, go over to our last speaker of today. It's Veronica Veneziano, and she is the CEO of the Biodiversity in Good Company. Uh, initiative and, and, and her field of uh, activities include agriculture and sustainable food systems, agrobiodiversity, strategic development, network coordination, events management, and internationalization. Thank you for joining us today. Please, Veronica, we have just uh, eight minutes, seven minutes, please. Um, hi, I will try to be as fast as possible. Thank you for the invitation. I think we can just go with the first slides or with the next one. I will try to um, give uh, a short insight about uh, one of our networks. First of all, who are we? We are the Biodiversity in Good Company. We are a business and a biodiversity initiative. We were launched during the CBD COP9 
in 2008, which took place in Bonn, in Bonn and it, in Germany, and it was the first initiative, one of the pioneering initiative to address uh, biodiversity within the private sector. We were founded by the Federal Ministry for Environment, and we uh, had a successful transition 2011, so we were financially independent. We um, created our initiative as a, an NGO, basically, and we are funded by the membership fees. So the companies who are members of our company, of our initiative, uh, they uh, basically support financially uh, the activities uh, of the initiative. I have three animations. I think we can just um, put them all on, basically. Yeah, thank you so much. So our milestones are, we have a mission statement, which of course tackles the CBD and the main three goals of the CBD. Uh, the members of our initiative, they are um, um, submitting a leadership commitment, but we also have um, a progress report. This is really a milestone in our initiative. Every company that becomes a member of our initiative is um, um, submitting a report about their biodiversity activities and their biodiversity projects uh, every, on a, uh, every two years. So this is uh, just uh, the premise to be part of the initiative. The goals of the initiative is, of course, to create exchange, uh, uh, to create a dialogue, to uh, create knowledge, uh, to supply best practice, to see what companies already do, to see what's happening at the on the legislative legislative um, level, just to really create like a um, a very positive uh, loop of information. Because in Germany, but also in other countries, we know that one of the main main challenges around biodiversity is there are not standards or monitoring system that can be applicable to be uh, to to all the sectors and all the um, production steps. And of course, and now I'm coming to the point that I was asked to present today, we have a, quite a big network. We are part of the uh, CBD Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity. We are part of the European Business and Biodiversity Platform. And we are also coordinating a special platform, which is called Unternehmen Biologische Vielfalt. That means to, um, to do business with biodiversity, but also to engage for biodiversity. I have just one more slide, the next one where you can only see very fast what type of members are part of our initiative. So we are intersectorial, we have big companies, we have small family business and SMEs. So this is just to give you a final uh, introduction to the inter initiative. We can go to the next one, um, which is specifically about this project that we coordinate for the Federal Ministry for the Environment. Uh, since 2013, we have um, uh, taken lead on the coordination of this platform for mainstreaming biodiversity, not with the companies, but specifically with the business federations and associations. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, so what do we do? Basically, we are a specific platform for a specific target, a specific uh, um, stakeholder group, which is the business association. As you may know, companies are very active. They can decide quite in an easy way how they want to develop their strategies. But of course, uh, business associations and business federations have in different internal structures and they represent much bigger groups because, of course, they represent either chambers of commerce or uh, sectorial companies and so on and so on. So it was very important for the federal ministry to create a specific platform where these kind of stakeholders can come in touch and in dialogue with, for instance, uh, um, um, NGOs and environmental and nature conservation organizations just to see how can we come uh, in a dialogue, how can we can exchange, how can we find projects together when we can support each other. So everything what is happening at the level of uh, UBI, it's basically um, on a voluntary basis, uh, but that means uh, it's a huge commitment for the business associations because actually they were not legally uh, obliged to do anything, but they are committed and they are committed since 2013. Um, and we organize for them regular meetings, of course, since Corona now, of course, everything is digital, but we will try uh, and um, start after summer to, to meet physically again. Um, but what is important is that we organize, for instance, some thematic uh, online seminars, of course, and we have also uh, some um, um, hands out and tangible information. We can go to the next one. 
Um, I just have some uh, examples. This is the structure basically of UBUC um, up uh, left, the institutional partners, the, as I mentioned before, General uh, Federal Ministry for Environment, but also the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs is part of it, plus of course the Na uh, National Agency for uh, Nature Conservation. Ah, Veronica, we, we lost the connection. Do I can? I had some problems with the connection. Can you hear me now? Yes. I hope so. Good. Okay, I'll just go on. Exactly. If you so can, the main federation. Good, it's, it's the best for me because yeah. I have only two minutes. Yeah. Okay. We can go to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted maybe to mention some running activities. You can just uh, do the animations. We have, as I said, uh, some hands out about how to integrate. You can just scroll the, all the, the animations. We have hands out about how to integrate biodiversity on your premises within your communication with the, within the supply chain. We can go to the next slide. Um, some other activities. Yes, so this is probably the also the last one I can use. I can skip the other ones. It's important we started last year, we launched the uh, project German Business for Biodiversity. This is our advocacy uh, project for um, um, collecting biodiversity commitments from the private sector in Germany uh, to be, uh, of course, integrated within the post-2020 biodiversity framework, or we hope so. It's uh, basically a part of our project to to make um, business stakeholders in Germany uh, um, more closer to international uh, uh, processes. It's important for them to make it more tangible because sometimes like global biodiversity processes and dimensions are kind of ab abstract for companies. Um, so this is basically the platform we are still uh, coordinating. We will be uh, submitting uh, bi biodiversity commitments uh, for, for the next CBD in the next months. We have collected some, uh, there are very interesting ones, very ambitious. I can also share in the chat box some examples of how companies, but also business stakeholders and business associations and federations um, um, really committed to biodiversity and committed to shape in a good way the next biodiversity framework, to, uh, framework for the global perspective in the next year. I have two more slides, but I think, uh, yeah, I hope I was fast. But uh, I don't. I didn't have my, my my whole ten minutes. But it's okay. No problem. I'm here if there are any questions. Vielen Dank, Veronica. I'm sorry, but uh, we are we arrive at the end of the. But Bianca, I think we have no time for question. What do we think about that? No, we ran out of time this time. But um, we will make sure to have a look at the questions that were uh, placed into the chat box, and we might yeah. get back to the people uh, with answers if needed. I just want to uh, take the opportunity to thank everyone for, for being with us this morning. Thank you for the, the, the presentations. They were very informative and very interesting. Um, I just want to highlight that um, I am very glad to have uh, Veronica and the uh, Biodiversity Good Company uh, on board with the Global Partnership. Uh, they've nice been supporting us from the beginning. And also um, the action agenda has gained um, a lot when they started doing the work, focusing on the commitments from the, the German business sector. And I want to thank uh, Claude and all the, the speakers. Uh, they were very interesting, very, very um, engaging. And we will be having other sessions in the future leading up to COP. So I hope we can see you all very soon. Thank you so much. So back to you, Claude. Yeah, I, I have to conclude very, uh, very rapidly. Uh, I, um, if you have questions, please feel free to write to Eliana Graf. Uh, I think uh, you will have the the, 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 the address uh, linked. And uh, once again, thank you very much to uh, to GIZ to uh, uh, each one of your speaker. I'm sorry for the late uh, for, 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 for the because it was too late. And uh, Andreas, Mar Mar Mauricio, Eliana, uh, Charlotte, ba Bianca, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a pleasant, uh, pleasant day and uh, and uh, good, good, good weekend and good end of week. Thank you very much. Thank you. See bye. you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.